absolutely quite surprising to the integrated form of water camp. So that concludes my presentation. I'll hand over to Ryan. Thanks, Keith. Um, and we'll do questions at the end. So, the last presentation today is uh, Ryan Fogelman. Um, <coughs> this is a presentation of why you've uh, had to minimise and eliminate bias in a way of cycling synthesis. Uh, Ryan is Vice President of the Strategic Partnership with Fire Rover, focused on bringing innovative safety solutions to the market. Two of the solutions are one distinguished Edison Innovation Award for industrial safety and consumer products. Um, he has been compiling and published and reporting 20 different sites of CT files in the US. And the uh, website is available to us. Yep, very good. Okay, so, um, so, uh, since February 2016, uh, and the waste of cycling is annual report. So, I'll hand it to Ryan for Hey guys, so on the last one of the day, so is everybody excited? I mean, we, we had a reprieve of, of session four, so I hope that uh, no one's sleeping yet. We haven't had that many desserts. Um, you know, I appreciate everything that, that uh, Keith has said, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, the purpose of me being here is not just to talk about the fire rope system. Um, the purpose of me being here is to talk about really what we've learned in the U.S. Um, over the past seven years. So I was really thrown into the fire, and again, I, mean, I don't say that as a joke. Um, in 2015, I work with innovators, right? I, I love people who develop products and, and invent products. Um, the problem is a lot of the inventors need to stop before you get your patent and then just stop, right? And I, I, I'm sure everybody knows someone who built something in the garage, they spent their entire life saving it, and you know, they end up turning it into, um, they end up either selling it off at a discount or you know, a lot of, of uh, things happen. So I help these inventors um, really get their products to market and I help them brand their friends' products. So one of my best friends, believe it or not, he called me up one day and uh, he had done security in scrap metal. So he was literally known for high-end security using, uh, you know, using thermal cameras for um, scrap metal facilities. And you know, his whole job was to keep people out, right? People were coming in, they were stealing his products. Um, a lot of these uh, facilities were in rural and urban, in, uh, urban areas. And uh, he called the fire department, they wouldn't show up. So, he, you know, he was in a front line seat. He kept seeing, you know, these, these fires that were occurring with ASR piles, like pin piles or shredders, and uh, you know, they would basically burn. You know, they would have, uh, they, you know, they would burn like, the entire facility, and they would basically melt the cameras. So, really, um, Brad called me up, and he's like, you know, one of his customers had said, "What can you do to, to help me?" And Brad, you know, Brad asked him, and he basically said, uh, "Next time, put the fire out." And you know, Brad was just rich enough, smart enough, dumb enough, right, to just go in and he, he, he started Fire Rover, brought in my two partners. Um, Brad's actually since passed away, but um, his legacy has lived on, you know, through, through the solutions that we built. Um, and again, fast forward seven years, you know, when we first got into business, um, I was at my first paper, plastics, and recycling show, and I met one of my customers who was advanced disposal. And advanced disposal now has been bought by waste management, but they, they at the time, they actually had four fires, two major fires and two kind of minor fires, and they were public companies. So they had lost like 4% of their, their, their uh, gross revenue that year, and they were answering the calls. And basically, you know, they were asking what happened to you know, all this business, and it was all through fires. So, you know, the first time I'm doing this, I walk up and I meet Brad, he's from the south of, uh, of the U.S., and I basically showed him my system, and I go, well, what do you think of it? He's like, I like it. I, he's like, I, I, I go, how many do you want? He goes, why do I need it? And I'm like, because you acquired it. So he's like, do I? And I'm like, don't you? And he said, well, do my competitors? And the answer was, like, I couldn't, I didn't know, right? So I went out to try to find data. And you guys think if you don't have data, the UK has data, right? I've actually used the UK's data for the last 20 years of waste and recycling facility fires. Your EPA does an amazing job. Not to say that our EPA doesn't do an amazing job, but they haven't. So I, I basically went out and started reporting the waste and recycling facility fires. So I pulled them through Google. These are public fires. Um, and again, it's, uh, these are only in facilities. These don't include landfills. These don't, don't include uh, truck fires. And I've been doing it now for four years, uh, among a lot of things. So if you do want a copy of it, you can uh, link it with me. But basically, if you've seen this graph, this I've been building this since the first year, and you know what we've really seen um, 
you know, what we've really seen is the, uh, the trend has basically gone from in 16 and 17, I was this crazy guy going out there saying that we were gonna have a lithium ion battery wave that was about to crash on, on top of us. Um, nobody would talk about it. The no CEO of many major corporations in the United States wouldn't talk, or would talk about it. In 18, it crashed, right? And all of a sudden, we had all these fires. I, I had VPs calling me and saying, okay, Ryan, I, I need to understand, why do we have fires? Like, it's not just if you're a bad operator. There's an inherent risk of fire in what we do is waste and recycling. Um, and then again, we've done a little bit of a better job over the last couple of years, but this year we've seen another huge spike. And again, we know this is hockey stick. Right? We know there's going to be a lot of fires, and you guys are all like, I mean, everybody else has done a good job scaring everybody on how many lithium ion batteries are, are causing the issue or in, in the industry. They are coming, they're not going anywhere. They're actually very safe, right? Less than one in a million of lithium ion batteries that comes out of manufacturing ever has an issue. It's what people do with them that what causes them to have issues. Well, we're not rough on it, or we're not gentle on our trash, right? I mean, think about what we do to our trash. So again, now does that mean that, that, that we can slow down our operations and now we can go, you know, really work on a pre-sort perspective? Well, we can't do that from a cost perspective because we need to be efficient. So really, there's a lot of people who talk about education. I love education, I'm all for it. But guess what, we need more than that. Every single thing that we need, whether we're looking from a fire protection, it's prevention, it's uh, education, and it's technology. And all the best operators and the guys with the best technology and, and, the, uh, and the, the, the education is just a piece of that, internally and externally. Um, so really, the idea is this. I started uh, putting together our fire what the client saves because the idea is that if we have an inherent risk of fire in what we do, and again, this didn't just start with lithium ion batteries. 50% of our fires are, I call them traditional fire batteries. They are from your propane tanks, they're from the hot and dry environments, they're from um, you know, fireworks, when you know, briquettes and all the different things that are actually inside. I mean, think about the last year, how much hand sanitizer has been put into your waste room. I mean, just think about that for a second. Within a year, we literally have dropped gallons and gallons and gallons of it. And again, I call it that recycling, most people call it wish recycling, but people basically have a magic box that sits out their curbside, they take all their products, they drop it in, it disappears, they're, they're, they never get in trouble for it, nothing ever happens, there's no consequences. What am I gonna do as a, as, as a human being, right? Paint, drop it in, it disappears, right? So the other, like one of my, uh, Jim Emerson, I, I, I wrote an article in uh, International Fire Journal, if, if you guys, it has the 14 steps for um, protecting yourself against, against the waste of recycling fire. And he'll basically say that we as the public like put bombs inside or create bombs accidentally, right? We go in and we take our happy bag and we've just done an oil change and we take our, our rags and we drop them into you know, the garbage bag and we close this thing as tight as possible and we put it out by the curbside. And again, it's 100 degrees, like 90 degrees outside, sun beating down, it's 120 degrees inside, and you have this little container that's literally filled with fumes. You drop it into you know, a compactor, it crashes, and all you really need is a spark, right? So whether it's lithium or an aerosol can or whatever, I mean, like, we wonder why we're having so many truck fires. So the idea is this, it's not bad that we're having fires. We can have fires, right? The, a lot of industries actually have fires and inherent risk of fire is what they do. It's the severity of fires, it's how fast you catch them, and how many of them become catastrophic. That catastrophic is a huge piece of it. So we literally, these saves are, I mean, those, those numbers are extremely low. Our numbers now are like 96 to 72, 86. I publish them every month at Waste 360. But basically the idea is this, Here's our savings, right? And we're in over 5%. We're in eight of the top 10 waste recycling companies in the, in the US. We have 250 locations. We've had four catastrophic losses. We've never had a catastrophic loss start in an area that we protect. So again, I'm not guaranteeing that I'm never gonna have a catastrophic loss using our system. We, are, we have layers and approach, and I'll get into that. But at the end of the day, the operator still has to operate. It still needs to prevent. The fire department still has to come on scene. Sometimes, right? Hopefully, to a better incident, but they still have to be trained, and all the all the things that everyone's talking about, all these layers of protection, all need to be in place for you to have best practice. 
And then we know the publicly reported fires come from reported fires. Typically, these guys are, um, you know, typically these are the three alarm, four alarm, five alarm fires, right? No one's talking about the individual fire that happens, you know, and, and, and somebody catches it real quick. No one's seeing it. So I really think in the U.S. the number is about six times that number. If you guys look, our numbers are similar to yours. It's insane, right? I mean, we have 360 million people in the U.S. and Canada. You guys have 60 million people, right? So, I mean, our fires are definitely underreported. And I think even the EPA just came out and said that. So I break it down, and again, I'm not going to get into all the little levels of detail, but I break it down into all these different pieces. So if you do want to see my annual report, please, um, please uh, take a look. Everyone has talked about you know, yeah, and again, great data comes out of the UK. You guys really do a very good job on the, you know, looking at and actually taking responsibility for your actions, but it's very similar. Your, your WTS and your HWRC is 50% of your fires. Ours are 50% of our fires in waste, pack, paper, and plastic. So very similar. What's causing the fires? Again, I've gone into this. Um, what I really want to talk about most is, uh, is the consequences, right? And I think, you know, I always talk about WISH, and I've heard it today a couple of times. A successful fire incident is successful if you have it out and you have it contained, you're back to work within four hours. I might be screwing that up a little bit. I don't believe that that's the case, right? I have 10 minutes. So I'll show you why I have that. My goal is four hours for me is like, it's over. I mean, at that point, if I'm still working on something four hours later, it was a massive fire incident. And the big thing that we have here is that you know, according to uh, Material Recycling World, which again is a, is a, is a, a, a UK or a, a, a EU based uh, uh, report, but basically they said 75% have are, are down from one day or more of their, their fire. So again, fires are okay, and a massive fire is not okay, right? Severity of fire is the most important piece of this. And you know, they talk about the different um, severity levels, which I know people have mentioned today. Um, again, you see my number, it's six times that number, right? So in the U.S., it's 2.5 billion. You guys are talking about what we need to do from a recycling perspective. We need to change the labels. Do, is, is the, the U.S. should be on the forefront of going after manufacturers for this issue, right? I'm not saying they're evil. We all, every one of us in, in the public, we are begging for more power. We want it smaller. We want it to be in every single possible thing that we have. We are begging for it. They are just giving us what we want. Now the question is, how do they do it from a safer perspective? How do they do it knowing that the waste and recycling operators are dealing with basically most of the cost? And guess who's dealing with the rest of the cost? The fire professionals, right? In the United States, we have 1.2 million firefighters. 700,000 of them are volunteer fire department or fire firefighters. That less than 2% of money is spent on training them. So it's, it's really, a, it's a big issue and these numbers are huge. And again, it is collectively, if we take all of our, our uh, collective power and we actually use it against the manufacturing operators, which the manufacturers now are basically spending a ton of money on our association to ensure that, that we don't do anything. So again, you know, it's uh, probably not the best thing to say in real life, but I mean, I, I say it because it is 100% true. Um, injuries, and you know, this is one of the things that I hear that, you know, the reason that fires weren't a big deal in the U.S. from a waste and recycling facility perspective was because we have other issues, right? Slow down and get around. We have, we have people who are injured and killed every day, um, you know, like, uh, that work on the front lines. So, you know, we do have injuries and we do have deaths that are reported due to these fires. Again, I'm not breaking off the lithium ion batteries. What happens at a waste facility, period, it's, it's, it's a, uh, or if it happens at a waste facility, it's, it's due to a, or due to a fire. It is uh, reported. Now, again, this is only publicly reported, and most of these are fire professionals, right? And this is what I try to stress to everybody. It, it's the fire professionals that we are now causing, like, they're dropping it downhill, and then we're just passing it off, right? So most of the time, fire departments will not, or fire professionals will take a defensive approach. They are not going to go fight with fire unless you work with them. You have, we have these cap systems that we sell that, you know, they allow you to, to the fire department comes in, they make two twists, they're now fighting a fire, and you know, they, by the time they have everything else set up, it's a better chance of them helping you fight your fire. Because in the US, and I think it's here too, if you call the fire department, if they don't want to fight it, they won't, and they don't have to. 
um, it's really, you're trying to incentivize them to feel safe enough to go in and fight that fire. Um, so this is where we get into insurance. And again, this is what happened in 2019, right? After our 18, it happened here. Um, we have less than five providers. The, the, these are the, the top five key providers. And this was given to me by um, the Insurance Office of America. And basically, those are the claims from 2018 and 2018 um, you know, for shredders and for lithium iron batteries. So this is where we see, again, 50% of the fires that we see are traditional, 50% of the fires that we see are lithium or are some type of battery. So what's the solution, right? And again, I talk about the combinational approach, but really what that means is that it's, I mean, it, it takes everything. And again, this is really the most important piece. You have prevention, which is your job to be a good operator, right? Operators have to have best practices. They have to have the best technology. Fire res response, they need to be trained. They need to have the right tools to fight the fire to feel comfortable and actually fight it. Internal response is really what we focus on which is what I do at Fire Rover. My goal, again, is not to have a major fire incident. My goal is not not to have a fire incident. Again, we're gonna have fires. They're gonna happen. Can I catch them in the incipient stage? During that 10 minutes, can I catch it earlier in the process? And then can I do something about it? Because, again, there's a lot of competitors who come, come out and they have thermal cameras, right? Well, thermal cameras are only one thing. I, I have thermal cameras on a lot of our sites, and they do well. You can do an early detection you need to verify it, and you need to call the fire department, and then you, we also have the ability to respond. So really what we, what our system is in, in itself is it's a fire rover box. It's a 20 by 8 by 8 container. It just needs internet and electricity. There's a thousand gallon tank. We use an environmentally friendly cooling agent, and we'll sit this outdoors or indoors. If it's outdoors, we have a 22 foot mast. It's so it basically works like on shredder yards or in piles um, and indoors. We'll actually sit it up against like the back of the building or outdoors, heat it in its cool, and then all you're going to see in your, you know, in, in your ceiling is cameras and an oven, right? That's it. Everything else is, is customized, and you know, you can see that, a picture of it here. And so, like, we offer a bunch of different solutions, right? We have our thermal only solution, which again, for some of the smaller sites, it makes sense and it is enough based on a risk reward. Um, and then we have our cap systems. We also have an on-watch system for landfill facings, which is a, uh, it's a product that, it, it's a trailer and you can move it and literally set it to the landfill. It'll work for three weeks and then you set it again. It's 100% renewable energy. So it's wind powered and it's solar powered and it's 4G. So this thing's completely wireless. It's made for harsh environments um, like landfills. The fire rover solution is a six to 10 minutes that we can shoot. It's the finite amount. Um, and again, it's typically used in addition to the fire sprinklers. A fire sprinkler replacement solution, we have over 100 facilities in the United States where the fire rover system is in there as the only means of fire protection. We have variances of fire rover and replace sprinkler systems. Again, we have to go to the NFPA code, we have to write a performance-based um, justification for it, and we have to have it approved, and we, we end up fighting for those. So when we do that, what we've done is we've actually built a, um, I, I did this, so, Everyone's talking about lithium ion batteries. You have, you have two different problems. A MERV lithium ion battery is a small battery that is inside a pot, right? You're, you're not trying to blanket, you're not trying to start a lithium ion battery with oxygen. So we actually have facilities that are, are full lithium ion um, processing equipment. So think the large automotive OEMs. We're protecting a couple of their buildings at this point, and we're, we're doing more and more of them. But basically, if you think like, my person who's fighting this fire not only is fighting the fire and they're trying to get thermal run away, but if you have a pallet that's sitting there with 30 different batteries on it, five batteries, whatever the size of it, one of them goes off. We've all heard today, that thing is not, that, that your issue is if you can get that stop, that's awesome, right? Chances are you can't. But it's the collateral assets that now need to be sprayed to ensure that nothing else can burn inside of it. Now the other thing is we put a fire roller quick neck on the outside so the fire department comes, they can take a defensive approach. They never have to walk in the building and they continuously work with us to fight the fire. So this was really stemmed from in Arizona, we had a surprise Arizona, um, about eight firefighters, I think four were police officers and four were uh, firefighters. Um, you know, they got seriously hurt and, and died from an explosion inside a lithium iron battery operation for a storage or a, or a battery storage facility. Oh. 50. 
No, I mean, I just, uh, I, I have video after video and I can show you how it works. If you go to Fire Rover's YouTube, you're more than happy to take a look at it. Again, I'd rather spend time on the, uh, the real solution, but let me just walk through uh, one solution. So this will be how it works on a, on a tip board. Um, we actually, you're gonna see a fire in the, uh, in the metering drum. You're also gonna see a fire that's out um, on the, um, you know, from a couple of the embers from the metering drum popped on. And so again, we're spraying this kidney bean is located, and again, it's our central station. These are, we train and work so hard to keep these guys 100% educated on our clients and our clients, um, you know, operation. So they know what a scrap metal facility is. They know what an ASR pile is. They know the difference between smoke and steam based on, you know, our analytics. So all the different pieces. We can shoot in darkness, we can shoot in, in full smoke. Um, so again, they're gonna spray, and then the beauty of our system is that, like, if, if there's ever an issue, we come out and we fix it, and, and we replace everything for our entire um, for the warranty for free. So it's a really all-inclusive solution. When we're standing next to you fighting this fire, we can't guarantee we're putting it out, but no one could. That's what insurance is for. But I can mitigate that risk to a point where the insurance company is typically a lot happier and understand that it, you know, this is something that makes sense. Um, but so with that, I will. Uh, I think we can take questions. Thank you very much. We'll get all the slides anyway, I think, won't we? What is that? We'll get all the slides anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, again, you can go on YouTube because, I mean, the, these slides are all big, but yeah. most of my customers, my customers allow me to share them, so some of them do. Some do not want to share it at all, but to me, when you share them, it's safety, and we learn from you know, all the videos that we have from a lot of different pieces. Okay, um, so anybody, questions? Three very interesting presentations. So anything on insurance, detection, or suppression? Or are we getting too close to three o'clock? <laughs> so can I just ask in America, sure. that people have been talking about you know, the fact that we've had lithium ion fines, fires, um, developing for years. We've known about it for a long time. It's getting worse, but nobody really seems to be doing anything about it. Do you get the impression in America that there is a solid effort to try and change the way that lithium ion batteries are used, the way they're manufactured, to the way that they are inserted into equipment, or are you just, if you like, dealing with the aftermath, getting better at being able to deal with the way that they cause the problems? I mean, I, I, I think as a whole, the U.S. is they didn't even admit that there was a problem until 2019, 2020. And again, you'll see Jim Fish from you know, the CEO of, of Waste Management actually said, I have a fire in my transfer station. It's like every day of the month of whatever. I mean, you know, so again, I think nobody wanted to admit that there was a problem. Now people have admitted it and they're working on it and we are working on solutions. But I think the next level is how do you organize? Because you have so many disparate factors. We have SWANA, we have ISRI, we have um, National Waste and Recycling Association. You have uh, like call the recycle that is literally, they're spending all their time, um, you know, really trying to like, everyone has their own agenda and no one's working together on it. And that's the big issue. So I would say the answer is like, yeah, I think California is probably the furthest along trying to take the recycles, like the recycle sticker off a of battery. And again, if California does it, I mean, even in the US, they're 10% of it. So if they get that done, that'll be a major breakthrough. Um, but I think on an overall basis, I mean, I, th I think the world needs to come together and go after the manufacturers, right? And again, not from a negative perspective, but as a, out of the money that they're making, we're, we're talking, I mean, a billion dollars, right? It seems like a lot, but how, the manufacturers are making billions and billions and billions of dollars. So let's just hold them responsible and make them pay their share for, you know, the problems that are unfortunately falling on this industry. Something for government. Yeah, sorry, question down there. Two questions. Um, I think outside of the composite market, yes. Um, small syndicates, so, so when I'm talking composite, I'm talking the likes of Zurich and Aeon and, and, Aeon and the big players. Um, no, I don't think they will engage. Um, maybe on the low risk spectrum, but ultimately when you look at RDF, SRF, probably not. Um, the small syndicates that are born out of Lloyd's 
um, that we deal with, the likes of Helvetia, Brovitas, people like that, we, we can pull these people in. Um, we've been doing it for years now, so ultimately we have, you have to dangle a carrot somewhat to say, you give, us, you give us your money and we'll make you this money back. Um, it's just a difficult conversation for underwriters to have. I think there is room to engage, but like I said to the gentleman on the, the question previously, it's an uphill battle to get an insurer back in. When they look at their loss ratios over the last 10 years for recycling, they've been burned in previous years from the, the lack of protection systems. It's hard to change somebody's mindset and get outside of, of the, the lower risk industries and get them back into the, the hazardous environment. Another question for me around terms, do you look at uninsured losses and, and do you see uh, you know, the lack of available insurance increasing the risk in the, uh, in the waste industry? Um, it's, it's... <sighs> It's not hidden. Um, the insurance premiums are extremely high in our sector. They, they typically double the cost of a standard commercial facility, if not more, depending on the process. Um, the, the, the under insurance then comes into play when people just can't pay that premium rate um, and, and they've not got the mortgages or, or the banks asking them or the leasing companies to have that insurance. We do see uh, non insurance and under insurance in the market is rife. Um, that's our problem to sort out regarding under insurance. There is a, a massive PI issue with that and, and brokers because they want to sell a, a lower rate premium. You're insuring your two million pound building for a million. Doesn't mean your insurer is going to give you two million pounds. Um, but then the, the uninsured is, it, we, we, we see it whereby people say, well, self insure. That, that's fine. They have a fire. They pay the money out, we're never self-insuring again, we'll go back to the insurers. But then it's too late, because you've had that fire incident that you have to declare, why did you? And then, so is it looks more of a moral issue. And, and those, those factors all play a, a key decision-making process between securers and insurers. Okay, I mean, it seems to me over the next 10 years, it's gonna be very difficult for a lot of the smaller operators to keep going with all the risks associated with it and the changing sort of nature of waste um, and the costs involved in, in trying to stay compliant with the agency and compliant uh, with the fire service and uh, with insurance. So I'm yeah, glad I'm going to be retiring soon. Yeah, I can completely agree. Um, it, it, premiums increase, banks ask for more insurance layers put in place um, and ultimately rates increase so you, you can't ask for the money. And it's it's the egg and egg and the chicken scenario. So it's it's difficult, and the, the next five years will be extremely difficult in the insurance market. Yeah, and can I say? I mean, you know, we work with a lot of high risk um, outside of waste and recycling, and we're seeing this everywhere, right? So I mean, we're, we're doing a refinery right now, and again, I mean, their 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 premiums like triple in one year if they had AIG. So it's not to say. I mean, this. I'm not saying it's just happening in waste and recycling. I think we're all saying that yes, we, it is. It, it's becoming more and more known in waste and recycling. But I think a lot of industries, you know, from the fire perspective, of it used to be water, 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 water. Well, how do we now figure out a way to do things that are targeted and work and lower risk mitigation? And again, it's happening across a ton of different industries. And the insurance is what's driving a lot of it, right? Because as they raise their premiums to where it makes sense from a monetary perspective. You know, you're, they're out there trying to figure out how to change their business and make it less risky. Mm. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are aware that the exemptions are due for a change fairly shortly. A lot of exempt sites are going to have to come under permits. Uh, there's going to be a lot more demand for, for sites to, to both do all that they've got to do to comply, to have fire prevention plans, and obviously then to get insurance, because I'm sure a lot of exempt sites don't have insurance at all. Yeah, we do. We will go to a lot of exempt sites and we see it heavily in the, the polymer processing industry whether it's um, regrinds or extrusion facilities yeah. where they're under that tonnage threshold and they don't want to go, go above that because they don't want the, the permit and the FPP. Yeah. We've got companies on our books that say they want to operate underneath that threshold because ultimately the, the, the financial investment. Um, it's, it's, it's a big leap between exemption and then investment for FPP compliance. Absolutely. Okay, so no final questions. We'll, we'll leave it there. And once again, thanks for the last these three speakers. Um, so just remains for me to thank you all for coming.
coming um, and uh, obviously to thank the sponsors for today's event and there's also a short vehicle showcase outside if people would like to join for GPSV to talk through the vehicle um, which I think is just outside the front door please do join us and clearly I hope we'll all come back again in 12 months time who knows what's going to develop over those 12 months thank you very much and goodbye thank you